a very good evening aspirants. I welcome you all to the Hindu daily news analysis brought to you by Shankarayas Academy. Aspirants, many of you are watching our videos without subscribing to our YouTube channel. So, please subscribe and hit the bell icon button so that you will get regular updates about our controversy videos. Today, I am going to cover important news articles from the Hindu newspaper dated 23rd of November 2023. Displayed here is a list of topics that we will be discussing today. At the end of the video, we will also have prelims practice question discussions. So, try to watch the entire video. Now, let us get into our first news article discussion. Look at this news article. This article is taken from science page. See the 2023 United Nations Climate Change Conference, more commonly referred to as COP28, will take place at the Expo City in Dubai. The article says that the COP28 will focus on reducing methane emissions. This is the crux of the news article given here. So, in our discussion, we shall see some basics about methane. See, methane is the simplest alkane gas composed of one carbon atom and four hydrogen atoms. Methane is colorless, odorless and highly flammable gas. It is the primary component of natural gas which makes up about 95% of natural gas reserves. Note that methane can be used as a fuel for power generation and heating. Okay. Now, what are the sources of methane? See, methane is produced through both natural and man-made activities. Natural sources include wetlands, oceans and the digestive process of animals like cow and termites. Human activities such as agriculture, coal mining and fossil fuel extraction also contribute significantly to methane emissions. Here, agriculture is the predominant source of methane emissions. Methane is also produced through anaerobic digestion of organic materials by microbes. Okay. So, these are the sources of methane. Now, what are the environmental impacts of methane? See, methane is a potent greenhouse gas which traps heat in the atmosphere. It is about 28 times more effective than carbon dioxide in trapping heat. Methane is the second most abundant greenhouse gas after carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. High levels of methane in the atmosphere contribute to global warming and associated climate change. Methane emissions are a significant concern because they have a huge impact on Earth's climate system. Okay. So, these are the environmental impacts of methane. Now, finally, we will see the initiatives taken by the Indian government to mitigate methane emissions. The first important step is the introduction of Harith Dara. See, the Harith Dara is an anti-methanogenic feed supplement to the cattle. It was prepared and introduced by the Indian Council of Agriculture Research. The feed has the potential to cut down cattle methane emissions by 17 to 20 percentage. This feed can also result in higher milk production. Okay, This is the first initiative. The second important step is India Greenhouse Gas Program. This program is being led by World Resource Institute India, Confederation of Indian Industry and the Energy and Resource Institute that is the TERI. This program helps the Indian companies to measure and monitor their greenhouse gas emissions including methane. This program uses tools and methodologies from World Resource Institute's Greenhouse Gas Protocol. This program provides comprehensive measurement and management strategies to the Indian companies to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Okay, this is the second important step taken by the Indian government to reduce methane emissions. And the last important step is National Action Plan on Climate Change. This action plan was launched in 2008. This plan aims to create awareness about the greenhouse gases that causes climate change. This plan also provides some steps to counter greenhouse gas induced climate change. Under the plan, the awareness is being created among the public different agencies of the government, scientists and industries to counter greenhouse gas emissions including methane. Okay. So, these are all some of the important steps taken by the Indian government to reduce greenhouse gas emissions including methane. Okay. And that's all regarding this discussion. In this discussion, we saw about the basics of methane, then we saw about the sources of methane, then we saw about the impacts caused by methane and finally, we saw some points regarding the steps taken by the Indian government to reduce methane emissions. Now, with these points in mind, let us move on to the next news article discussion. 
look at this news article recently the directorate general of civil aviation that is the dgca imposed a fine of rupees 10 lakh on air india the fine was imposed for not following the dgca rules regarding passenger facilities recently the dgca carried out inspections at delhi kochi and bangalore airports while carrying out inspections the dgca observed that air india was not complying with the provisions of civil aviation requirement as mandated by the dgca so this is why dgca find air india okay this is the crux of the news article given here now in this discussion let us understand the basics about the dgca and its functions now let us start with dgca the directorate general of civil aviation which is in short called as dgca is the regulatory body that governs the safety aspects of civil aviation in india it is an attached office under the union ministry of civil aviation the dgca headquarters are located in new delhi with regional offices in various parts of india the administration of the dgca rests with the director general of dgca now coming to the question is the dgca a statutory body see india is having aircraft act 1934 this act contains various provisions for the control of manufacture possession use operation sale import and export of aircrafts in india this aircraft act 1934 was amended in 2020 the section 4a of aircraft amendment act 2020 talks about the creation of dgca for the regulation of civil aviation in india so as it is mentioned in the parliamentary act the dgca is a statutory body okay now with this basic information let us see the functions performed by dgca the dgca performs various functions in the aspect of regulation of civil aviation in india now let us see them one by one firstly the dgca regulates the registration of civil aircrafts secondly the dgca formulates the standards for civil aircrafts in india it also provides air worthiness certificates to civil aircraft that meet dgcs standards thirdly the dgca issues licenses to pilots aircraft maintenance engineers air traffic controllers and flight engineers it also conducts various exams to check their skills fourthly the dgca checks the proficiency of flight crew and other professionals like cabin crew and flight dispatchers fifthly dgca issues certificates to aerodromes here aerodrome refers to a place or area where small aircraft can land and take off sixthly the dgca issues air operators certificates to airlines that are based in india and lastly the dgca conducts investigations in various incidents and accidents involving the aircraft it can also implement safety aviation management programs for preventing future incidents okay so these are all some of the important functions performed by the dgca see the government of india is planning to replace this dgca organization with a civil aviation authority this is modeled on the lines of the usas federal aviation administration okay and that's all regarding this discussion this discussion is about the basics of dgca and then we saw about the functions performed by dgca now with these points in mind let us move on to the next news article discussion look at this editorial article this article talks about the link between animal cruelty and child abuse according to the editorial article when animal abuse happens in a home it often means there is child abuse too the authors substantiate this point by quoting a study conducted in england according to the study out of the 23 families that had history of animal abuse 83 percentage of children in such families were at risk of abuse or neglect so increased reporting of animal abuse can help to prevent violence against animals and children however in india the connection between child abuse and animal cruelty is often ignored and in india the anti animal cruelty laws are not implemented effectively for instance the national crime records bureau does not even collect data on offenses registered and prosecuted under the prevention of cruelty to animals act 
she not enforcing anti cruelty laws harms both animal and people so according to this editorial article indian government must take some steps to effectively report and monitor animal cruelty this can help to prevent violence against both animals and children okay so this is all about the editorial article now in this discussion we will solve a mains question related to child abuse in india look at the question in 2022 about 2 lakh 4000 cases related to child sexual abuse have been reported in india in the light of this above statement analyze the challenges in preventing child abuse in india and list out the steps taken by the indian government to prevent child abuse 250 words 15 marks see this is a straight forward question the question demands us to do two things first we have to write the challenges in preventing child abuse in india then we have to write the steps taken by the indian government to prevent child abuse in india okay see this question can be asked in general studies paper 1 under the indian society part or it can be asked in general studies paper 2 under the subheading welfare schemes for vulnerable sections of the population by the center and the states and the performance of these schemes okay so this is all about the syllabus now let us start answering the question let us start with introduction since the question is about child abuse you can define child abuse in the introduction part since it is a 15 mark question you can also mention about the impacts of child abuse in the introduction part see you can either define child abuse on your own words or you can write a standard definition of child abuse as provided by the international organizations now i am going to provide you with a definition provided by unicef so according to the unicef child abuse include physical or emotional ill treatment of a child sexual abuse of a child negligent treatment of a child then inflicting serious physical and emotional harm to a child then commercial exploitation of child then any act or failure to act that results in death of a child then any act or failure to act that places the child in an imminent risk of serious harm and finally it includes the act that harms a child's health survival development or dignity see all these acts constitute as a child abuse according to unicef the unicef says that child abuse can take place at home school child care institutions work and in the community often violence is perpetrated by someone known to the child see this is the definition provided by unicef along with this definition of child abuse you can also add a data about child abuse in india see according to a study conducted by the national commission for protection of child rights that is the ncpcr nearly 55 percentage of children in india experienced some kind of abuse so you can also mention this data in the introduction part having covered the definition of child abuse let us see the impacts of child abuse see the unicef also mention about the impact of child abuse which can also be used in the introduction part some of the impacts of child abuse mentioned by the unicef include learning difficulties poor performance at school low self esteem depression risk behavior and self harm so these are the impacts of child abuse so you can use these points in the introduction part of the answer okay now moving on to the main body of the answer as i mentioned earlier the question demands two things first you have to write about the challenges in preventing child abuse in india and secondly you have to write the steps taken by the indian government to prevent child abuse now first let us take up the challenges the first challenge is lack of awareness see sex education is one of the most neglected topics in india it is often neglected due to cultural and social norms of the indian society so lack of knowledge about consent sexual health and intercourse often make children especially teens vulnerable to manipulation and abuse many cases of child abuse go unreported due to a lack of awareness among children caregivers and communities this lack of awareness lead to lack of reporting of child abuse see according to a survey conducted by the ministry of women and child development a significant percentage of children in india do not report abuse okay so the first challenge is lack of awareness then the second challenge is 
change in Indian family structure due to globalization. See, the Indian family structure has seen a significant shift from a joint family setting to a nuclear setting in recent times. This has left the child more exposed and vulnerable to perpetrators of child abuse. As the family model transitioned from a joint to a nuclear one, the Indian child is also experiencing a transition from protection by the other members of the joint family to vulnerability. So this is also a major challenge in addressing child abuse in India. And the third major challenge is India's societal and cultural norms. In India, there is a general acceptance of physical punishment as a means of discipline. As we already saw, physical punishment is also a type of child abuse. The physical punishment also has other impacts as well. When abuse occurs, children fail to open up to their parents out of fear of physical punishment. So the general acceptance of physical punishment as a means of discipline leads to under-reporting of child abuse in India. Another unique thing to India context is that parents in India place high expectations on their children much beyond the child's capability. So when the child fails to meet such high standards, the parent tend to physically and emotionally abuse the child. So the acceptance of these kinds of emotional and physical abuse as a norm is one of the main challenge in addressing child abuse in India. Okay. So this is the third major challenge. Then the next challenge is due to socio-economic problems. See India is a fast developing country but still around 15% of its population is multidimensionally poor. As of 2021, 23 crore Indians lived in poverty. This high level of poverty is also a main reason for child abuse. It is because the children of low income households are very vulnerable to abuse. In addition to this, in India, we have the infamous caste system. Children from marginalized communities often face abuse from their teachers and peers in schools. So the socio-economic condition in India is one of the major challenge in preventing child abuse in India. And lastly, there is a clear lack of preventive steps taken by the Indian government. See, India has a wide range of laws to protect children. But these laws come into play after the abuse happens. Even though the perpetrators of abuse get punished, the damage is already done as the child will be scared of life. So lack of preventive steps from the government to prevent child abuse is also a major challenge. Okay. So these are all some of the challenges in preventing child abuse in India. Having covered the challenges, now let us see the steps taken by the government to address child abuse. First, we can mention about the POKSO Act. The Protection of Children from Sexual Offenses Act, that is the POKSA Act 2012, is a comprehensive legislation that deals with all aspects of child sexual abuse. This act was enacted in response to the widespread cases of child sexual abuse that were being reported in the country. It is aimed at protecting children from all forms of sexual abuse including rape, molestation and sodomy. The government has also set up special courts to deal with child abuse cases. These courts are equipped with all the latest technology and tools to help speed up the trial process and ensure that justice is served swiftly and effectively. So this is the first important step taken by the Indian government to address child abuse. Then you can mention about the National Commission for Protection of Child Rights that is the NCPCR. The NCPCR is a statutory body established by the government of India under the Commissions for Protection of Child Rights Act 2005. It was set up with the mandate to protect, promote and defend child rights in India. See this commission is also functioning to prevent child abuse in India. Then to prevent the economic exploitation of children we have the Children Labour Prohibition and Regulation Act 1986. See this act prohibits the child labour practices in India. So this is the third important step. Then in 2013 the government launched a national helpline for children in distress. This helpline is open 24 bar 7 and it is staffed by experts who can provide counselling and support to children who have been abused or in danger of being abused. Okay. And finally, the government has also started conducting various awareness programs related to child abuse. For example, in 2020, NCPCR organized different online programs for awareness generation on various aspects of child sexual abuse and POKSO Act.
द अवेर पोग्राम वाज कंडक्टड इन अफिशियल सोशल मीडिया प्लाटाम अपार्ट फ्रम दिस एनसीपीसीआर हेज आलो डेवलप्ड सैबर सेफ्टि गईन फार चिल्रन ओके सो दीस आर आल सम स्टेप्स टेकन बै द इंडियन गवर्मेंट टू अड्र चईल अब्यूस इन इंडिया ओके सो दिस आल अबउट द बाडी पार्ट आफ द आंसर ना कमिंग टू द कनूशन पार्ट सी द कनूशन फार दिस क्वेश्चन कैन बी लाइक ए वे फारवर्ड यू कैन शेर युवर ओपीनियन अबउट द स्टेप्स दट कैन बी टेकन टू अड्र चईल अब्यूस एफेक्टिवली यू कैन जस्ट मेन्शन अबउट द पॉइंट्स मिस अवट बै द गवर्मेंट लाइक कम्यूनिटी एंगेजमेंट टू एनक्रेज आक्टिव पार्टिसपेशन बै पेरेंट दैन यू कैन रईट अबउट एंगेजिंग वित् एन जी ओस फार इनफर्मेशन डिसमेशन यू कैन आलो मेन्शन अबउट टीचिंग द पेरेंट अबउट पासीव पेरेंटिंग स्टेल अंड हव टू यूज पासीव री एनफोर्समेंट रेदर दैन कॉर्परल पनीमेंट यू कैन आलो मेन्शन अबउट कैपासीटी बिल्डिंग आफ आल स्टेक होलडर्स इनवालविंग चिल्ड्रन कैर गिवर्स अंड टीचर्स सो दिस कैन बी ए वेल रउंडेड कनूशन फार दिस क्वेश्चन ओके and that's all regarding this discussion and this discussion is about the challenges in preventing child abuse in india then is about the steps taken by the indian government to prevent child abuses in india and finally we saw some points regarding the steps that can be taken to prevent child abuse effectively now with these points in mind let us move on to the next news article discussion look at this news article recently the kambala samiti announced that Kambala race will take place at Bengaluru between November 25 and 26. See this is the first time the Kambala race is going to happen in Bengaluru. A total of 228 pairs of buffaloes from various parts of Karnataka will take place in this race. So this is the crux of the news article given here. Now in this context let us understand some important points about Kambala. The Kambala is basically a buffalo race. It is a popular festival takes place in coastal districts of Karnataka such as Dakshin Kannada and Udupi. Note that the people in Kasaragod district of Kerala also celebrates Kambala event. The Kambala event takes place between November and March months. Traditionally, the Kambala event is sponsored by local Tuluva landlords. Note that Tuluva people are an ethnic group native to southern India. They are mostly living in coastal karnataka okay now let us see how the race is performed kambala is performed on two parallel race tracks filled with slushy water buffalo are usually raced in pairs during kambala race event they are held together with plows and ropes during the race the racers try to bring the buffalo under control by whipping them with sticks now why kambala festival is celebrated Traditionally the Kambala was non competitive festival the event begins after harvesting the paddy during the month of October Kambala is a festival dedicated to Lord Kadri Manjunatha who is an incarnation of Hindu god Shiva see buffaloes are a big part of the farming life of coastal Karnataka people so they conduct the Kambala event as a gesture of thankfulness and gratitude towards the god for the good health of buffaloes so this is the reason behind the celebration of kambala event and that's all regarding this discussion in this discussion we saw various facts about kambala event see this question can be asked in prelims so revise all the facts that we discussed now with these points in mind let us move on to the next news article discussion look at this news article from the business page this news article is about the crisil report the report says that assets under management of the non banking financial companies are expected to grow at 14 to 17 percentage okay so this is about the news article given here now in this context let us see some important points about non banking financial companies the non banking financial companies which is in short called as nbfcs are financial institutions that provide banking services but they do not hold a full banking license in india for example NBFCs are registered under the Companies Act of 1956 whereas a commercial bank is required to obtain a license for commercial banking businesses from the Reserve Bank of India the license is provided under the provisions of section 22 of the Banking Regulation Act 1949 okay now coming to the regulation of NBFCs in India the non banking financial companies are regulated by a variety of organizations For instance the NBFCs like investment and credit companies and 
இன்ஃப்ராஸ்ட்ரக்சர் ஃபினான்ஸ் கம்பெனிஸ் ஆர் ரெகுலேட்டட் பை த ஆர்பிஐ ஆன் த அதர் ஹேண்ட் ஹவுசிங் ஃபினான்ஸ் கம்பெனிஸ் ஆர் ரெகுலேட்டட் பை த நேஷ்னல் ஹவுசிங் பேங்க் தென் த என்பிசிஸ் லைக் மர்ச்சன்ட் பேங்கர் அண்ட் வெஞ்சர் கேபிட்டல் ஃபண்ட் ஆர் ரெகுலேட்டட் பை செக்யூரிட்டிஸ் அண்ட் எக்ஸ்சேஞ்ச் போர்ட் ஆஃப் இண்டியா தட் இஸ் த செபி தென் த என்பிசிஸ் லைக் இன்சூரன்ஸ் கம்பெனிஸ் ஆர் ரெகுலேட்டட் பை த இன்சூரன்ஸ் ரெகுலேட்ரி அண்ட் டெவலப்மெண்ட் அத்தாரிட்டி ஆஃப் இந்தியா then the chit fund companies are regulated by the respective state governments and finally the nidhi companies are regulated by the ministry of corporate affairs so this is the reason i mentioned that the nbfcs are regulated by a number of organizations now moving forward let us see how nbfcs are different from banks the first major difference is in relation to demand deposits while the banks can accept demand deposits the nbfcs cannot accept demand deposits here demand deposits are nothing but saving accounts the second difference is that the nbfcs do not form part of the payment and settlement system while the banks are part of the payment and settlement system thirdly as the nbfcs are not part of the payment and settlement system they cannot issue check books fourthly the nbfcs cannot offer money transfer service that is the fund transfer service like the traditional bank do then the next major difference is that the nbfcs do not have to maintain any reserve ratio such as cash reserve ratio or statutory liquidity ratio whereas banks must mandatorily maintain this reserve ratios also nbfcs cannot provide the deposit insurance facility offered by the deposit insurance and credit guarantee corporation here deposit insurance is a protection mechanism provided by governments to safeguard depositors money held in banks it assures the depositors that their funds up to a certain limit will be reimbursed even if the bank fails in india non banking financial companies cannot provide deposit insurance so if you deposit money in a non banking financial company and if that particular nbfc becomes insolvent or bankrupt the money deposited with the nbfc will be completely lost okay so these are all some of the differences between normal banks and non banking financial companies now you may have a question if we already have banks why do we need the non banking financial companies see we need non banking financial companies because they play an important role in india firstly they ensure credit expansion nbfcs play a significant role in providing credit to sectors that have difficulty in assessing credits from the traditional banking services for example individuals who have a poor credit score find it extremely difficult to get a loan from any bank even if they are willing to pay a high interest rate this is because traditional banks have fixed lending rates as well as specific sums that they can lend so these individuals therefore can assess credit from the non banking financial companies okay so this is the first important role. secondly the nbfcs provide flexible and niche financial products the nbfcs provide financial services like vehicle financing microfinance housing finance consumer loans and more this helps broaden the scope of financial inclusion thirdly nbfcs also play an important role in infrastructure development nbfcs like indian railway finance corporation rural electrification corporation limited they provide long term funding for infrastructure development projects fourthly nbfcs help to support investment activities they provide financial services related to wealth management asset management and financial advisory and finally the nbfcs act as a competition to traditional banks okay so these are all some of the reasons that why we have nbfcs along with traditional banking institutions and that's all regarding this discussion and this discussion is about the basics about non banking financial companies then we saw about the differences between non banking financial companies and traditional banks and finally we saw some points regarding the creation of nbfcs in india now with these points in mind let us move on to the next part of the video that is to discuss preliminary practice questions as friends today we are having three questions let us solve them one by one look at the first question i will read out the question which government body in india is responsible for regulating civil aviation and overseeing the safety of civil flight operations maintenance of airworthiness standards and licensing of personnel involved in aviation activities option a bureau of civil aviation security 
ஆப்ஷன் பி ஏர்போர்ட்ஸ் அத்தாரிட்டி ஆஃப் இந்தியா ஆப்ஷன் சி டைரக்டரேட் ஜெனரல் ஆஃப் சிவில் ஏவியேஷன் ஆப்ஷன் டி ஏர்கிராஃப்ட் ஆக்சிடென்ட் இன்வெஸ்டிகேஷன் பியூரோ இதை கரெக்ட் ஆன்சர் இஸ் ஆப்ஷன் சி சி த டிஜிசிஏ இஸ் ரெஸ்பான்சிபிள் ஃபார் ரெகுலேட்டிங் சிவில் ஏவியேஷன் அண்ட் ஓவர் சீயிங் த சேஃப்டி ஆஃப் சிவில் ஃப்ளைட் ஆப்ரேஷன்ஸ் அண்ட் இட் ஆல்சோ மெயின்டைன்ஸ் ஏர் ஒர்த்தினஸ் ஸ்டாண்டர்ட்ஸ் அண்ட் இட் கிவ்ஸ் லைசன்ஸ் டு பர்சனல்ஸ் இன்வால்வ் இன் சிவில் ஏவியேஷன் ஆக்டிவிட்டீஸ் ஸோ த கரெக்ட் ஆன்சர் ஒன் செகண்ட் இஸ் ஆப்ஷன் சி டைரக்டரேட் ஜெனரல் ஆஃப் சிவில் ஏவியேஷன் மூவிங் ஆன் லெட்ஸ் டேக் அப் த செகண்ட் கொஷன் ஐ ரிலேட்டட் த கொஷன் விச் ஆஃப் த ஃபாலோயிங் இஸ் ஏ ப்ரைமரி சோர்ஸ் ஆஃப் மீத் அண்ட் எமிஷன்ஸ் இன் டு த அட்மாஸ்ஃபியர் ஆப்ஷன் ஏ ஆட்டோமொபைல் எக்ஸாஸ்ட் ஆப்ஷன் பி இண்டஸ்ட்ரியல் ஸ்மோக் ஆப்ஷன் சி லைவ் ஸ்டாக் ஃபார்மிங் ஆப்ஷன் டி ரெசிடென்ஷியல் வேஸ்ட் இன்சினரேஷன் இதை கரெக்ட் ஆன்சர் இஸ் ஆப்ஷன் சி லைவ் ஸ்டாக் ஃபார்மிங் சி மீத்தேன் இஸ் ஜென்ரேட்டட் டூரிங் த டைஜஸ்டிவ் ப்ராசஸ் ஆஃப் அனிமல்ஸ் பர்டிகுலர்லி ஃப்ரம் கேட்டல் ஷீப் அண்ட் கோட்ஸ் த மீத்தேன் இஸ் ப்ரொடியூஸ் இன் தேர் ஸ்டொமக்ஸ் டூரிங் த பிரேக் டவுன் ஆஃப் ஃபுட் வென் அனிமல்ஸ் ரிலீஸ் கேஸ் மீத்தேன் இஸ் எக்ஸ்பெல்ட் இன் டு த அட்மாஸ்ஃபியர் ஓகே ஸோ லைவ் ஸ்டாக் ஃபார்மிங் இஸ் த ப்ரைமரி சோர்ஸ் ஆஃப் மீத்தேன் எமிஷன்ஸ் இன் டு த அட்மாஸ்ஃபியர் ஸோ கரெக்ட் ஆன்சர் ஒன் செகண்ட் இஸ் ஆப்ஷன் சி லைவ் ஸ்டாக் ஃபார்மிங் moving on let's take up the final question this question is regarding nbfcs that is the non banking financial companies this question was asked in upsc prelims 2010 look at the first statement they cannot engage in the acquisition of securities issued by the government see this statement is incorrect although the non banking financial companies need not maintain crr and slr they can invest in government securities and rbi also mentions that nbfcs can engage in acquisition of shares stock bonds debentures securities that are issued by government or local authority so first statement is incorrect this is because the nbfcs can engage in the acquisition of securities issued by the government now come to the second statement they cannot accept demand deposits like savings account see this statement is correct as we saw in the discussion the nbfcs cannot accept demand deposits like the normal banks here only second statement is correct so the correct answer for the question is option b 2 only with this we have come to the end of the video if you found our video to be useful do like comment and share it with your friends and don't forget to subscribe shankar ais academy youtube channel thank you for listening